off. We are doing this for the first time this year for the OCB activity proposal solicitation. Um, we can drop that link in the chat for those of you who haven't visited yet, but we recently put out a call for OCB activity proposals and we wanted to do this informational webinar with a few of our experienced OCB network members who have proposed and led an OCB activity, whether it's a working group or a workshop or a training activity. So we thought this was a good opportunity to share their insights with you as the community if you're considering submitting a proposal yourself. Um, there's a lot of detail in the activity proposals solicitation, and I encourage anyone who is interested in submitting something to just arrange a chat with me, and I'm happy to discuss your idea with you and, and help you craft something that would be amenable to different aspects of the solicitation requirements. Um, for today, I really just want to let our scientists who have led OCB activities do the talking and really glean their insights on the process. This is really focused on the process of proposing, submitting a proposal, putting it together, and, and then running the activity and, you know, some of the, the, the pitfalls, you know, what, what went well, what didn't go well, how were you, how did you manage to be inclusive and different aspects of just running an OCV activity, I think are, you know, and I think you'll, we have, um, working group and, and workshop and training activity leaders here today who have really had a lot of different experiences. I mean, every activity is different, of course, but I, I think that their wisdom will be really appreciated if you're considering putting anything together. Uh, we have a mix today, and I'm going to let each person introduce themselves and their activity. If they want to share slides, they will. And then we can open it up to any question and answers at, at the end of this. And this is being recorded so that we can share this on the activity solicitation website so that you can all have access to it afterwards. So with that, I think I'm going to go based on my screen and introduce Amy Neely from NASA Goddard first. Excellent. Hi, Heather. Hi, everyone. Um... Thank you for inviting us here to do this. I think this is a great idea and super important. Um, so briefly, I just wanted to go over uh, our working group. So this working group is led by myself, Sophie Clayton and Nicole Poulton at Bigelow. And the heart and soul of this working group is to develop standards and best practices for the collection and assessment of operational phytoplankton observations. I have to say that slow because it, it's a little bit of a tongue twister for me, um, using particle imaging instruments. And what we mean by that, uh, we call them PIIs for short, is basically instruments that take images of phytoplankton and other particles in the water column. So imaging, flow cytobot, flow cam, all these different ones that have come out over the years. Um, one thing, you know, the three of us talked about is there's really no established uh, standards and best practices for the collection um, of these analyses, as, of these samples, as well as interoperability between different instruments. Uh, we, a previous working group that was uh, funded by the OCB looked at how we um, report these data um, to public archives, but not how we actually collect them. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, so we will hopefully come up with a, a best practices document at the end of this that will um, have both internal external community feedback so that we can all be on the same page with collecting these massive amounts of data. So we're super excited about it. Um, we had our first in-person meeting at Bigelow Laboratory in August. It was very successful. Um, and I kind of just wanted to briefly just mention a few things that I learned because um, I've done this a couple of times now. Well, more than actually more than a couple. And I feel like every time I do this, I learn something new. Um, and one thing I really learned mostly from Sophie who got this from her other working group with Nicole, I believe, um, was this setting the stage for a, a respectful and inclusive environment. And that's not something I had done before. Um, and I think everybody really appreciated that to just make sure we all listen to each other, we all respect each other's 
opinions and people don't talk over each other and things like that. Um, so I think that worked really well. Um, I thought that was a really nice idea. Um, another thing that we did during this working group is we had, it was a lot less talking at people and more based on our objectives. It was more everyone interacting um, in breakout groups, sessions, and, you know, coming up with the idea. So it wasn't us talking at them. It was, it was the members, the participants that applied to be a part of this working group, um, bringing the information forward and coming up with the ideas. Um, so we had a lot of breakout groups, um, which I thought made it more productive rather than just a bunch of like plenary talks, talking, talking, talking. We actually did the work. Um, so people, we actually got feedback directly from our participants. People really liked that. Um, we tried to incorporate a lot of breaks so that you're just, you're not completely brain dead by the end of the day. Um, you know, we had some walks outside. We had a couple little activities. We had nice dinners. Um, you know, everybody was awesome. Everybody was so nice and so engaged. Um, so I, I feel like this is probably the most successful. I mean, all of them have been successful in all the, in different ways, but as far as the interactiveness and the productivity of the working group, I felt like this one was probably the highest so far because we came out with an outline for a document not, that now everybody is working on. Um, so those are the kind of things I learned through this process that I thought were really, I would definitely use again for, if I, if I do this again for another working group, I would definitely apply some of these, um, these tactics and these uh, the breakout groups, et cetera. Um, so that's pretty much all I have to share. I just wanted to, to share those ideas. Thank you so much, Amy. I think that the, the, the participation the, in setting that intention is so critical. And you, I know I was very active in that other working group that, that Hillary, Hillary and Sophie were leading. And, and I certainly appreciate that so much. And I'm so glad that you were able to incorporate that successfully. I am going to look to the next person on my screen and it looks like it is Alec Wong from Huey. Thank you, Heather. Uh, uh, can you hear me? All right. So uh, yeah, this is a good uh, uh, kind of reflect on what we've done on this uh, fishery-based uh, observational network. Uh, it's a steering uh, uh, working shop, a working group, uh, I mean, a uh, workshop. Uh, let me share some slides. Um, so, All right, can you see this? Yes, right. looks good. Okay, yeah, so uh, um, uh, I think this this is a kind of a newer um, type of workshop uh, um, in which uh, engage, uh, you know, fishermen. Um, so I, this is the first of the experience I've been, uh, you know, working directly with uh, fishermen. I involve them in this uh, planning and, uh, and the execution of the, the all steps. Um, so, I mean, the idea is not new. Uh, so using a fishery-based uh, uh, network uh, to uh, deploy sensors, uh, collect the uh, uh, ocean data. Uh, and then, but so far the, the, uh, the collection is all focused on uh, physical parameters. So we think that to expand that further, uh, you know, to BGC observational uh, network, uh, it's, it's a, a good step forward. So this is actually started from a proposal uh, we did uh, a couple of years ago. We didn't got funded, uh, but I think this is a good uh, way to move forward uh, uh, using the OCD uh, uh, platform. So we, uh, you know, basically submitted a proposal and got funded. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's a large group of people uh, involved, some uh, from NOAA and commercial uh, fisheries. Uh, foundations and and uh, uh, and also uh, private uh, companies, tech companies. So uh, so this is kind of as I said, this is a kind of different experience um, because during the planning uh, stage, um, we have to consider a lot of um, uh, way to to engage a fisherman. Uh, it, for the science part, is straightforward. You know, to invite the uh, speakers and and planning on that. That's what we do, uh, we have done in the past, so that's not too difficult. Uh, the major worry for us is that whether we can uh, find enough fishermen to actually come to 
participate. So we did a couple of things. Uh, one is um, uh, direct connect connection uh, through uh, various uh, contacts on our uh, working groups. And, uh, and then we also give out uh, some stipends. Uh, so we budgeted some stipends to give out to fishermen who comes in uh, because we understand that if they come to the workshop, they're going to miss uh, some fishing activity. That's a, a cost to them. Uh, so we try to you know, compensate a little bit. And then we have a full coverage of their staying here. Uh, so that's, um, that's the strategy. There's a couple of strategy we uh, try to engage them. Uh, so I think it works reasonably well. Uh, and uh, we do have uh, quite some fishermen uh, comes in uh, all of the days, uh, but uh, some fishermen stay the, you know, the whole three days and then some uh, only stay you know, one day or you know, afternoon or morning, depends on their schedule, uh, but they all good and they all contribute. So that's, that's a very uh, uh, exciting. Uh, so, uh, I mean, so we talk about, this is actually from the proposal we uh, generated a couple of years ago. Um, this is kind of the, uh, the network uh, we're talking about, uh, there's some structure. So we start something like this and then let the fishermen know what we're really up about and then uh, where their role in this big picture. Uh, that's, you know, uh, they, uh, I mean, they've been doing this for a while. So when we talk about the uh, uh, BGC sensors, uh, they are relatively uh, accepted. Uh, though they not they don't exactly know what each parameter like pH or oxygen you know what what exactly they tell uh, them uh, they can understand the temperature salinity uh, but yeah, less uh, know about um, uh, the the BGC parameters so we we I did some uh, you know um, education actually along the way uh, so this is just the uh, structure of the agenda. So the day one, we talk about the state of the art uh, and then, you know, what is the program, existing program that what I mentioned is, uh, you know, the physical parameters, we've been doing this uh, for a while. Uh, so that's the, that's the existing infrastructure. And then we have, uh, you know, uh, panels, feature, uh, feature panels to discuss their experience, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, what may be uh, improved, uh, what they need uh, at the moment. Uh, and then second day, we have technology talks, uh, science talks, and then we have breakouts. And then the, the at the, the end of the day, we have this uh, show and tell lightning talk, which is uh, pretty exciting, I think. Uh, and then day three, we kind of come back to the uh, bigger group. I mean, we have uh, breakout groups, and then we come back to summarize uh, everything we, we talk about. Uh, here is the kind of the presentation uh, this is a, a couple of uh, slides, uh, pictures are showing the activity we do, we're doing. So long, you know, the uh, Jim Manning talking about the long-term uh, success of these uh, emote program, for example, that's uh, that's day one, uh, day two. Uh, and then there are breakout sessions, then there's a, a new technology, tell and, uh, show and tell. Uh, I think the most uh, interesting and um, I, I feel like very engaging is this uh, demonstration, uh, which uh, we have the fishermen up front and they show how the fishing gear works. And then by showing us that, uh, so that, uh, you know, we have a first hand understanding how we may be able to use this, uh, their fishing gear to deploy sensors. Uh, so I think that's very informational for me. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, uh, this, this is the, uh, one of the, a highlight and the other is the obviously the new technology a lot of people very interested in new technology and new database uh, uh, data uh, uh, simulation things like that and then also uh, you know um, uh, there are uh, the lightning talks that give uh, a lot of aspect who uh, the people who cannot uh, make the show and tell but they can they can show what they've done in the past um, so, and then we actually cover quite a bit, you know, data from data management and for the, to the modeling of data. Uh, so uh, I think that's, that's, that's about it. Um, thank you. Thanks so much, Alec. That particular workshop was one of my favorites just because of this opportunity to interact with fishermen, which I'd never gotten to have these sorts of co-planning, co-development of, observing operations, conversations, 
with fishermen in the room, um, sharing their knowledge and their hands-on experience every day on the water. It was really a lot of fun. I will pass the baton. I think Jessica Cross and Jamie Palter, are you going to co-present or talk together about the, M the Marine Carbon Dioxide Removal Workshop and working groups? Yeah, that sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, well, uh, hi, everybody. Um, uh, my name's uh, Jessica Cross. If you don't know me, I work for the Pacific Northwest National Labs out of Seattle, Washington. And Jamie and I are here to talk about a workshop that we co-led um, on marine carbon dioxide removal. Uh, we were joined on the uh, planning team for the working group by Patrick Rafter, Matt Long, Claire Reimers, uh, and Leonard Bach. Uh, those were the six of us. And really, we put together uh, the activity solicitation proposal for this working group because we as researchers were starting to get hammered with questions from private industry about how academia could start engaging with um, uh, uh, MCDR solutions, right? This was about the time that um, uh, uh, Accelerated Ventures was really starting to fundraise and, and there was really just a lot of private sector interest in trying to grow marine CDR solutions. So uh, we put together this workshop just essentially as a way of convening our colleagues to talk about, hey, this is what we want to do, uh, or, or this is what we're being asked to do, this is what the state of the science is. The state of the science is still really open-ended. There's a lot of unanswered questions. How do we as a scientific community start engaging with that? Um, we worked really hard um, to have the right stakeholders in the room, just like Alec did, um, and not focus kind of narrowly or exclusively on um, uh, uh, academic perspectives. Certainly wanting to push that academic perspective forward, but you know, again, with the right variety of people in the room. So we invited private industry to join us. Um, we feel like they were, uh, 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 one of the purposes of the workshop was essentially educating folks on, um, again, what some of these open questions are, what some of the opportunities were uh, in the near future. We also really tried to give um, folks an opportunity to engage. Uh, so in addition to trying to kind of put forward uh, the state of the science and, and host a lot of talks, we also really worked hard with our participants to um, uh, uh, sort of hear what their concerns were, what they what they were excited about, what their opportunities were, and make the workshop kind of dynamic and engaging and not just focused exclusively on listening to talks all the time. Um, another stakeholder group that we invited to join us were local community members um, who may have felt like um, uh, they didn't necessarily know what MCDR was or, or how to start engaging responsibly with this um, with this topic. Uh, and I think it was also really beneficial to have them in the room. Um, last, you know, once we got that group of people together, we sort of knew what we wanted to talk about, you know, in the planning process, we also focused really specifically on what do we want to get out of this workshop. Part of the reason we were able to raise funding for it is because the funding managers wanted the results of this workshop really badly, which is, what do we fund? How much money do you need uh, to answer some of these questions? And how do we sort of put forward a research plan uh, going forward from here? Um, I, it's not like we developed a wish list and they just started checking things off. That is not what happened. Um, but I think it was really helpful to sort of um, have their perspective framing the problem uh, and thinking through like what we wanted to accomplish by the end of the workshop. In what context are we trying to develop these recommendations? It's really trying to think about what we as a scientist community want to put forward as you know our highest priorities uh, for engaging the future. Um, Jamie, you want to offer other comments about our workshop experience? Um, yeah, I think maybe since you did such a good job um, kind of overview of the of our of what we were trying to accomplish and this kind of how we set the content. Um, and I think the I think that's great for for anyone who might listen to this after the fact who's trying to put together a proposal. Um, I could maybe offer like some advice for people putting together a proposal in a real, really general sense. I'm good at, good at offering advice as, um, 
my family might tease me for, but um, one is to get together a group of people who you trust and will like challenge you because, um, you know, like we had hard conversations. I was the last of the organizing group to feel okay about bringing an in industry. And I'm so glad I got convinced to do that because it ended up being like hugely valuable. But um, I think those hard conversations were like good and informative and made us really mindful of like what the hesitations are and how to address that. Um, so get together a group of people you trust with enough bench depth for the um, reality that we're all working oceanographers or many of us. And so Jessica went to sea before the, we were kind of handing off a lot of responsibilities. We had enough bench depth to step in and, and Heather is a saint um, and, and May is great support. And, but to step in and get the job done, people go to see people. And in this field, it's like, you're getting fire hose every day. Um, like in the, in the particulars of MCDR, things are happening really fast. So that was really, really critical to like pulling off the event. Um, Heather and May have put together a timeline, right? Am I right about that? About way, about things to, like a checklist that's a calendar checklist, which is absolutely brilliant. And if you stick with it, you'll be in much less pain than if you don't, <laughs> which we also learned some, in some ways we, we had their guidance, so it was fine. And in some ways we learned our lessons the hard way, you know, as we were scrambling um, to meet, to make sure everything happened on time. Um, and then once you have all like your major building blocks in place, there's still a lot to do um, to make the experience really valuable. So I think we had our building blocks in, and a few of us, including me thought, okay, everyone will show up and we'll have so much to talk about that it will all go great. But really putting thought into what, how you sequence the day, how much time we spend in breakouts, how much time we spend reporting back from the breakouts, um, how, all of the interactions through our time together, um, how, how we introduce the code of conduct, how much we do repetition on that to make sure it's going smoothly. All of those conversations still are take time before the event happens. Yeah, one thing that I don't think that we did very well uh, was putting people in charge of of like segments of the day. Like, wait a second, who's introducing this session? <laughs> what are we going to say? Like we had the agenda and we just somehow magically thought it was going to unfold itself. <laughs> um, so there were some of those, you know, very refined details that I think we could have benefited from more planning on. Yeah. That's true. Um, but it, but at the end of the day, because I think we had like a, an organizing group of six plus Heather and May, we were able to be agile at the end. I hope that we pulled it off. And so I think those are my overarching things. That is all about the workshop. And maybe I, I want to make sure everyone has the time to talk, but we are now even now in the transit in the transition mode of turning this into a working group. And that has been um, an interesting process that I feel like we've approached with a lot of creativity, but also, um, you know, we, we, but also it's a learning process. And so maybe, uh, maybe other people can talk about their experiences. And then if we have time, we can circle back around to um, creating a working group. Thanks. Last note I want to make is uh, just as the other groups highlighted um, the importance of a code of conduct, you know, part of the reason that all of the various stakeholders that attended our workshop got along so well and our breakout groups, you know, for the most part, state civil, as Jamie said, like there are diverging opinions in this community on things, uh, was because we really worked hard to emphasize this code of conduct. Like we are here to share sometimes diverging opinions. And we're also not here um, to tell anybody what the right answer is. Uh, and I think that sort of setting that stage and, and opening that up to people um, uh, was something that we thought about a lot in advance. We actually did plan for uh, and ended up being integral uh, to the success of the workshop, so. I could not agree more. I think that a lot of thought went into that. I, I, and I think it was one of the first gatherings where we brought so many different sectors together on a very rapidly evolving and sometimes contentious topic where people have, do have very strong opinions about you know, which method might be more effective than other or which technology should be deployed and where. I think that it was really valuable to have a set of ground rules for us to all engage. And it really, everything was civil and it was actually really fun. There was a lot of really fruitful dialogue that took place 
So I definitely want to commend this team on the, the thought that went into that code of conduct. And we will definitely make time for, because you submitted a proposal that included both the workshop and a working group right from the get-go. So we'll we'll circle back to this this one at the end, because I do want to to highlight that that's possible. We never could have predicted the direction the working group would take. Um, so that that's kind of a cliffhanger so that you'll all stay on till the end. <laughs> um, I'm going to introduce Nicole Millette. Um, Nicole is is leading a Mixotrophy, Mixotrophs and Mixotrophy working group. Yep. Um, hi, I'm Nicole. Um, uh, we, we started this working group in 2021. So we're actually coming kind of petering out here. Uh, we haven't officially wrapped up, but we pretty much wrapped up. Um, and um, I don't have any slides, uh, but the purpose of this working group, why we even formed it in the first place was because, um, well, per particularly in the United States, there's there's a, a fair number of people researching mixotrophs, an increasing number of people researching, researching mixotrophs, but we all seemed very separate and there wasn't a lot of cohesion or communication necessarily among all of these different peoples or any kind of like uh, clear directions that the field should be going. Um, so we wanted to get people together to discuss what should be future research priorities for the, this field that's rapidly growing. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, one of the big issues this field runs into is that um, in situ methods to study mixotropes is, well, methods in general is um, very behind um, and that one needs to be to be getting a lot of data that people want to get. So talking about uh, possible ways to get creative with existing methods and then where methods need to be developed. And those were the kinds of discussions we were looking to have. Um, in terms of running this working group, um, we, we were started during COVID. And so we, we were planning um, to have uh, small workshops but we also along the way were holding virtual, uh, I guess, seminars. Uh, we were aiming for six a year every, every other month. And I think maybe we hit five or something like that, um, at least for, for two, two and a half years solid. Um, and they're all, they're all on the uh, OCB YouTube page if you wanna go find them. Uh, but uh, with with these uh, these seminars, they allowed us to engage people outside of the official working group, and they were just like we would advertise them, open them up to to anyone. OCB, of course, help us advertise them as well, and would help with the the the, the technical support in setting them up. But we would put together, we would pick topics that uh, people were interested in hearing about, and we would constantly try to solicit feedback of what kind of topics people would like to hear on. And then we would invite speakers. Um, and usually we we would you know try to get people who are in the working group, of course, but we would also try to get people outside the working group um, as much as possible. So again, engaging people who weren't necessarily considered part of the official working group, but getting them there. And ahead of time, we would ask the speakers to submit some discussion questions. So there would be, what we tried to have would be about 15 minutes of talks per person. So two people, each about 15 minutes, and then trying to leave 45 minutes or so for discussion in breakout groups. So go to multiple breakout groups. Um, then there'd be the, the discussion questions that we've already put together. People would go through those and then we'd come back together and try to have a, a, a report out from that. And then, these, these discussion questions and people be writing in Google documents. So we we have like all of this information just recorded. Um, we have a lot, a lot of documents that um, to go through and that kind of, you know, important research directions as well as methods that people were, were thinking about. Um, and then in planning the workshops themselves, um, we, we were trying to be as flexible as possible. Uh, our first one was fall of 2021. And I think we had four total people in person, including myself, but everyone else was online and all of our meetings were hybrid. 
because they had to be. And the later meetings, because uh, we had a total of three, in, well, we get a total of three workshop meetings, um, one at VIMS, one at Hui, and one at Bigelow. And especially the ones for uh, Hui and Bigelow, there seemed to be like more people up front who thought they were going to be there in person. And then they started to kind of like shed off as it got closer, even though we were paying, you know, for everything. So that was one thing we always were having to deal with was just, uh, you know, people commit at one point, you know, you, we, we got the data and schedule as early as possible. People would commit and then you'd check back in and for whatever reason, you know, a variety of people could not make it um, anymore. Uh, but in actually running these meetings, uh, it's already been talked about with like having an agenda, which of course we we came up with as as well. But we also learned early on about just trying to be as flexible as possible in that agenda and be ready if if people are really really moving on something, uh, be ready to let something run over um, and shuffle around the schedule. Um, if if necessary, um, leave room for for a lot of breaks. People usually keep talking during the breaks anyway, um, and also over over dinners and things like that. Like a lot of sessions keep going. And as we did with our uh, virtual seminars during our meetings, we're also having like Google Documents open and in breakout groups, people just constantly recording things, just getting that information down so that it, we could refer back to it later as as needed. Um, and the other thing is obviously I didn't do this working group alone. I had four other leaders uh, for a total of 19 working group members at one point. Um, and yeah, it was just working with with the leaders first was really, really important because we were able to rotate around the effort as much as possible. So no one person was doing too much, but also we kind of had, um, it also felt like with me at least that I was the person who had to like, when, when, it, when a decision had to be made, then I would be the one to at least like having at least one person who will make a final decision when it's like, there's there's discussion among the group. It's like, do we do this? Do we do this? What, what do we think um, at least? And it's like, rather than, going back and forth forever about how to do something, um, it helped us at least to just have like a, a final say, someone being like, okay, this is what we're going to do. And then people just agreeing so that we could we could move move forward. At least for our group, that worked. I'm sure other groups, um, other other options work, work better. Um, so I guess I will leave it there. Thank you so much, Nicole. This working group was really fantastic for, you know, having this core group of subject matter experts across disciplines who would do the heavy lift together and plan, you know, what their what their products and 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 outcomes were going to be. But they also, I mean, like she like Nicole was saying, they would have these thematic webinars and having four or five of them kind of co-leading this really helped because one of them could kind of take the lead on a theme and, you know, find a couple of speakers and put together a nice webinar. But these webinars were open. Anyone could come. So they it was a really great way for them to engage a broader perspective of ideas and viewpoints, which I think really enriched their products in the end. Um, so I, I really applaud the way that this this working group did their did their work. So and their their in-person meetings certainly got a little more lively after COVID, at, you know, having being able to have more people. Um, so yeah, absolutely. This is this has been great. Um, I know that Jeremy Wardell, who is with us Today, he is from NASA Goddard, is going to talk about a training activity. So I'm going to have Jeremy go next because he has to leave shortly. Okay. Uh, hi, Heather. Hi, everybody. Heather, is the thing projecting? Yep. That's good. good. All right, cool. Uh, just one slide. Uh, my name is Jeremy Riddell. I'm a satellite oceanographer at NASA Goddard. Uh, I am also the project scientist for the upcoming NASA PACE mission. 
And so we had a crazy idea a couple of years ago about hosting a class on PACE for early career scientists. The general idea was getting this cohort of younger generation imprinted on our mission. And OCB was really fantastic in supporting this. Uh, the way it ended up working is we put in a proposal to host a one week class uh, at a local university here. We ended up with 129 applications. We accepted 46 students. Ultimately, 42 were able to attend. Uh, some were local, but the majority were from institutions across the US, including five from overseas, as far away as Uganda and Tasmania, as memory serves. Uh, I mean, jumping ahead, this is one of the most rewarding professional experiences I've had in recent memory. Uh, it was a really great process from beginning to end. Um, in terms of preparing for this and what uh, we did with early interactions with OCB was to craft a proposal that tried to be as inclusive as possible. And we did have to have some constraints on what we defined early career to be. But other than that, we explicitly sought out uh, MURUP representation, a dynamic range of scientific background, trying to get representation from multiple disciplines, given that we're a multiple discipline um, for science mission, and gender balance, uh, you know, a nice ratio of students from different backgrounds and different parts of the U.S. and abroad. When we finally put this together, having this wonderful mix um, mix of attendees, there was some realization, of course, that this is going to be kind of monodirectional if we just did all of the talking. And so what we really tried to do, knowing that we couldn't avoid that entirely, was to create a little bit of a more immersive experience. And so there were lectures and some of them were, were a lot. Uh, no hiding that, but there were also tours and hands-on training sessions. And actually one of the things that I think worked out almost the best for everybody was that several of our evening activities were planned around what we call fireside chats. And the idea here was to get out of the classroom, uh, find somewhere in the shade to sit and then bring in some special guest stars to have like a really informal conversation with, with the students. And this included folks from NASA headquarters so that they could have kind of a more familiar experience with the idea of getting to know your program managers and how do you write proposals and get on panels and just kind of get outside of the classroom a little and hear directly like after hours from the folks that uh, you know we all have to deal with now and, and, and work with. And then the other one was with a communications team at Goddard with the broader perspective of communicating science to the general public is difficult. And so why don't we spend some time talking to our experts, you know, people who do this for a living and you know how this could translate into anything from building a better poster to doing some kind of um, public facing media you know, with a TV station or what have you. So anyway, um, sorry for the monologue, but this was a really, really great experience. Um, uh, we got feedback from the students that was positive. For the most part, I, you know, we've actually used it to audition folks that we've considered hiring, which has been really fantastic too. The fact that these logistics were all handled just magically behind the scenes, uh, by me and Heather and Mary and others was um, just such a blessing, you know. And everything went online. So what you're seeing here is uh, the website that was created for us. Uh, the QR code should take it to you. Every lecture we gave was was recorded, so all of the material is out there for the world to digest. Um, we've been advertising this in our other mission activities as well, too, when we're interacting with folks who are maybe new to the field or don't have a lot of experience with what PACE is. So this ultimately not just became a great experience with students, but something that is going to have some legs and last in terms of uh, creation of training material to move forward. So, yeah, Heather, what am I forgetting? <laughs> 
It, it was awesome. It was so much fun. It really was. I, <laughs> I was watching it from afar, but it was awesome. It, uh, this group really, I mean, we had, of course, a bang up team at UMBC who could kind of get us access to things that we may not otherwise have been able to access and use being able to use the dormitories and, and just having, you know, having a nice campus to do this was absolutely amazing. So and, and yeah, everything, having through. everything be open, <laughs> Yeah, you know, all of this, all of these materials are open and available, the recordings, the lectures themselves, even I think the students who took the course shared a bunch of photos that are, um, if you scroll all the way down the, the website, we have a bunch of fun photos on there and like everything, if you ever wanted to recreate something of this nature, it is there and open for the world, so well, thank you. We're very appreciative of it. So. Anything, you know, with, with something as big as Pace coming online, I, I think, you know, we've had other um, short courses like this in the past. Like uh, we had an ocean acidification short course in 2009 that ended up being a model that other groups used in other countries and other parts of the world um, that it was a lot of fun and it was you know a lot of the people who participated in that back in 2009 were graduate students and postdocs and now they're funded PIs who are doing this work and it's just a very gratifying thing for me as the old person who's been doing this for so long to see um, you know that kind of capacity building especially with something as big as as pace or you know a new research area um, taking shape, I think, is a really exciting opportunity to do that kind of capacity building work. So if you have an idea, you know, for, for that, please talk to me because I would love to, to make that happen. Okay. Last but very much not least, uh, my longtime collaborator, Chris Osborne, is going to talk about the Seesaw Workshop. Great, thanks, Heather. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Chris Osborne. I'm a professor at uh, North Carolina State University, and I'm going to try to share my screen here momentarily. Um, I've got just one slide to kind of uh, to sort of to try to talk to. Um, going here. There we go, um, and. So the, the seesaw, the, the genesis of this, uh, it's got a long title and, and one of the cool outcomes of, of the, uh, the scoping workshop that we did here is that we now have, we kind of retitled it. We had actually defined what the seesaw was uh, a little bit uh, more. So it was looking at the time domain of controls of carbon storage, release and transformation in coastal and estuarine waters following extreme events. So that's a lot. And where it came from um, was was a, uh, a special um, session that Heather hosted at the 2022, it ended up being North American Carbon Program meeting, where we talked about this uh, um, extreme events and carbon cycling across the land, air, water interface uh, in these in these um, these coastal zones. And so, um, right from the get go with with this, we had interaction between OCB and NACP, North American Carbon Program, which was really great because it helped to, to very much um, connect communities. And that's what we wanted to do with this scoping workshop. We wanted to get um, the folks, the terrestrial ecologists and, and folks uh, that were working in um, more land-based, but certainly within the coastal zone uh, ecosystems and think about not just how carbon fluxes uh, transfer from land into the ocean or exchanges between um, land and ocean and, and even atmosphere, but specifically how extreme events such as hurricanes and, um, and fires were altering carbon cycling and altering nutrient cycling and fluxes and all that. So that was the, the idea behind this. And when we Put together our proposal. Some of the folks that were part of that NACP meeting were uh, became part of this, and um, that's like uh, John Kamenowski, uh, Tom Bianchi, uh, Hans Pearl, and uh, 
And then we reached out to uh, some other folks in order to try to build out um, our, our network. And so we had Dana Hunt um, and Sasha Kramer, Alan Roebuck uh, and Elliot White. And so that whole list of folks, uh, what they did is they really gave us this broad um, working group in order to, uh, as was shared before, um, kind of uh, uh, share the tasks, share the workload. So while I was trying to direct this thing, um, and, and and I should say really co-direct it because Heather and, and May and uh, uh, were uh, fundamental to making this, uh, this happen. Um, we had, we kind of split into sort of sub themes. So the first thing we did is we split our in, into about four sub themes and each lead there for the sub theme was able to reach out and find like, let's say our plenary speakers. And um, we tracked all this with, uh, with Google Sheets and Google Docs, which was really helpful for staying on task uh, and, and, and checking in with, um, with OCB. And, and what also helped in the early part of the planning was having just regular Zoom. So this was all you know happening as we were kind of coming out of uh, COVID, but still a lot of online work. And we utilized Zoom as a way to, to, uh, to get that together. Um, and, and that was, that was really important because it helped to define tasks, uh, and to check up on, on people and, and make sure that folks were, uh, were following up and, and do that logistical tracking, um, working with the OCB office to, uh, to get the venue space, which we were fortunate to have, um, the student union at, at NC state was kind of the place where we had all of this. And then as well, um, uh, some of the other logistics around town um, was, you know, was, was really great working with, with the OCB project office uh, from that uh, from that perspective. So a couple of things we did I wanted to share about this um, and more about kind of the programmatics and how this workshop uh, kind of uh, came off is we started with a mixer and we had uh, posters and lightning talks. And I thought that was really good um, as a way to kind of get people already conversing and moving around, but thinking about the science. So I gave a brief overview to, <clears throat> excuse me, get us started. And then we, we went through the lightning talks and, and um, circulated around the posters. So it was a nice social event. We had, I think, ended up about um, 70 people in attendance uh, and we had we had aimed I think for 80 so we did have a lot of attendance um, in we used a Google form to gauge attendance and to kind of have as a as a sign up sheet and so there we were able to um, get information on um, uh, you know uh, um, uh, uh, to help fill out the D the the DEI and address some of those um, uh, concerns we had to get balance in terms of career stage and discipline, regional uh, representation, and um, and all those sorts of issues, and that worked really well um, in order to to connect all those logistics together. So then having this um, uh, the agenda set, you know, we worked on that and kind of fought and argued over that uh, and the scheduling of everything early on in those series of Zooms uh, for the planning stage. And I think that was really important too, because what it did is it gave us this framework, but um, as was has been shared by others, it was a flexible framework. So we were able to kind of make modifications here and there um, as we went forward. And so we went through our several plenary talks over the next couple of days and then had good breakout groups after that with uh, plenty of pacing and timing, keeping people sort of well uh, hydrated and caffeinated and, and all of that and, um, and, and tried to have spirits high. Another thing we did that I thought worked pretty well too, and this was, um, we had a nice time of year when this happened, is that each morning we had a, a group of us that would walk from the hotel uh, over to the university. And I think it took about 20, 25 minutes. And it was really nice just as a group to kind of you know, get some fresh air and get out and kind of uh, um, get ready for the day. And then as well, uh, on, the, on the way back, we also had you know, um, bus support for, for those that, um, uh, that weren't going to walk. But, but that was a good activity, uh, again, to kind of break up 
and give people uh, opportunities to um, kind of uh, uh, relax a little bit and, and get some fresh air. So then uh, the last thing I, I wanted to kind of share is, is what we did as far as collecting information about this. So one of the things we wanted to do, as you can see in the four points listed here, is build this community practice and to try to get ideas about what are some of the next steps that need to be taken. Um, that's an ongoing process. And one of the things I'll share as far as continuity of where we started and, and where we're going is that at the upcoming Coastal and Environment Research uh, Foundation or Federation um, SURF uh, workshop that will be in Portland, Oregon this in November, we are uh, we're going to have a follow on social mixer and we're connecting with the HERS network and that's a more hurricane ecosystem um, uh, response uh, uh, network. It's an, an RCN funded by NSF and we're going to get community uh, the two communities together there and continue to try to build bridges and 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 push some of our ideas forward. So with that, I'll go ahead and. Um, uh, stop and, and see if Heather, what did I miss? <laughs> Thank you, Chris. That was amazing. And I really had a lot of nerdy fun at this workshop. This one was pretty near and dear to my heart for my research background. Um, I wanted to ask, cause I can't remember right now, Chris, is there uh, any sort of a link? Um, if there are people going to surf who might want to go to this little mixer that you're having? Is there a way for them to participate or learn where it is, when it is, um, um, that I can help yes. circulate? So we did, uh, we, we did, a, I think, one or two email blasts through um, through OCB and through the HERS network. And and through that, we, we did another Google form kind of off the model of uh, what we did for Seesaw, the OCB workshop. And so we have about 30 or so people that have responded back. We've been tracking if they're part of uh, OCB or HERS or, C you know, which, which how they kind of fit in there. And so we're going to um, be able to have that information, too, to continue building the community. That is really great to hear. And the um, I put a link to one of the things that this group did do is a put together a set of recommendations, actionable, rec actionable recommendations for extreme event studies in the coastal zone for the Ocean Climate Action Plan. And I put a link to that in the chat if anybody wants to look that over. This group is still moving and shaking and still growing. And I'm really looking forward to what comes next. Um, it could be a working group. It could be a lot of things, but I know that a lot of publications were being planned and, and a lot of research plans and priorities were being set. So a fantastic network that again, started with a special session on extreme events at, a North, at the North American Carbon Program meeting. And, you know, that's, you know, it's really fun to kind of track the evolution of, of a seed of an idea through to its realization. Um, and in this case, it was, it was an exciting time. Um, Oh, there was something else I wanted to say about this, but I'm forgetting it right this second. Um, I oh, I I just wanted to talk about the you know the the new realities of of extreme events um, and how you know the fire, the wildfire communities and the hurricane communities. How important it is to bring these communities together in a way that this workshop did, because a lot of the processes and and fluxes and and the episodic nature of the fluxes is very similar and the impacts on the coastal water bodies and even along the, the, the aquatic continuum on the way out to the coastal water bodies, a lot of these processes are really similar. And so I think it's really important that this workshop brought these communities together to, to learn from each other and, and even develop collaborations. So this one was was exciting for me. Um, They're all exciting for me. I feel like I'm giving birth every time I go to one of these things. These are fantastic opportunities to just bring different intellectual capital together. And, and it's been a really fun experience. Um, 
We've got another couple minutes. I wanted to invite uh, Jessica and Jamie to talk a little bit more about the regional nodes um, working group for marine carbon dioxide removal that is, is brand new. You'll see an article about it in the next OCB newsletter. Uh, I need to write that article. Uh, but yeah, you'll 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 kind of get the full story there. But I wanted to invite you both to to say a few words if you'd like. Jamie, this was your baby. <laughs> she always says. Uh, um, so um, right at the time that we proposed the um, working the workshop, we also proposed a working group in one proposal that the where the workshop would be informed by the results of the no reverse the working group would be informed by the results of the workshop and um you know once we finished the workshop actually we were um hard pressed to figure out what to do i'm not i'm not gonna lie we would just like put up an idea shoot it down like it, people the mcdr was evolving so quickly that we couldn't figure out what the niche was going to be that was gonna have the most value um and so we thought the thing that that spoke to us was to try to be a catalyst to spawn regional nodes. And so the idea um, is that we would do a like basically foster a launch event in each of several regional nodes and, and solicit new leadership for that, partially to have place-based leadership, partially to like rebuild community following the COVID pause, which I think we underestimate how we're all still kind of healing from that and moving on. Um, and um, I don't know, just bring more people together. And so that uh, we ran with that idea or started, actually, should we say we walked with that idea? Cause we we were a little bit like energy low for the, in terms of just like, we had to renew the well of energy after um, a vigorous workshop. And I don't wanna uh, like, and in, in all of the, the effort that went into that. So we started that, started that solicited new leadership to, um, to help spawn those nodes and we're in the process of doing that Je jessica i'd like to get get your thoughts here too yeah I, one of the things we didn't talk about um in sort of reviewing our mm -hmm. experience of an activity solicitation in the workshop is uh what it does for you as an organizer i mean it really at least for us I feel like we became the front of the field without meaning to, without <laughs> expecting to. Um, and you want to talk about a fire hose of information, like after hosting that workshop, really energetic workshop, we were all exhausted after it was over. And if anything, the calls for information and collaboration doubled. Mm -hmm. The NOP proposal call came out, what, like a month after that, which means that all of a sudden everybody was really, you know, focused on proposal writing. And again, I feel like it just threw so much um, energy uh, into an already very energetic field that it's just kind of, it, it was very hard for us as organizers and as folks who had kind of taken responsibility um, for organizing everyone else to start like braiding all of these different threads into some kind of pattern that made sense. Um, uh, it, it was definitely really challenging. Um, the other thing that we, you know, kept doing is we would make a little bit of progress and then find out that someone had already launched an effort to do that thing. Um, and we kept saying, like, what is there left for OCB to do? Like, why us why now? What can we be good at? Kind of exclusive to everybody else. Um, and we really felt like focusing on these place-based issues um, uh, is really where OCB had the opportunity um, to excel because, you know, over time, OCB has really been moving, you know, kind of in this direction. You've heard from multiple workshops that are like, ah, oh, OCB is getting really good at bringing together these diverse stakeholders and talking through these things and working with uh, communities directly. I think, you know, we really heard that uh, as feedback and that really is what wanted to draw or why we wanted to continue to uh, draw everything together. You know, when we wrote the original proposal, one of our goals was to create community around CDR that we felt like it had no home um, and it needed a home. So, you know, obviously we can't, you know, the six of us couldn't be the permanent home for MCDR. There was, there's just too much. Um, so how do we, you know, as leaders learn to delegate, 
hard thing for an early career scientist to learn to do. Um, but also, you know, how do we make sure that the resources that people need are actually there for them um, uh, when they reach out or they want to start engaging with CDR? And so that that's kind of where the regional nodes concept came from. Um, you know, CDR ultimately is always going to be place based. Mm -hmm. In some cases, your MRV solution is going to be at least a little bit bespoke, depending upon the region that you're working in, the time that you're working there, and the partners that you bring to the table, right? Um, so understanding that that's, you know, at least going to be a little bit true uh, for the foreseeable future. How do we equip the community to have, you know, the, the, the right connections that they need to engage in this kind of responsible research, all the way from doing the right MRV with efficient technologies and good industry partners, all the way down to partnering with communities in, in positive ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so our regional nodes are, are hopefully going to do that, continue in sort of these regional ways to bring more leaders into the community uh, and make sure that folks have those assets um, available to them as they start thinking about everything from building research consortia to just trying to plan, uh, you know, one project for a particular call that is coming out. Um, yeah. I think like that there's a temptation to give lots of anecdotes and and things specific to MCDR because we because the experience was so rich. Um I, I'm going to give one more and then try to like zoom out to think of what's what could be universally useful or more universally useful to someone thinking about a working group. The anecdote I'll share is from the workshop. We brought in all these stakeholders that at, on on paper you'd think um would have a lot to disagree about. Um you know, private companies trying to do MCDR uh, other companies trying to evaluate MCDR, uh, you know, people just, and then a huge academic group um, that wants to do every little, like in the breakouts, they're going into, they want to check the DNA of the phytoplankton, right? They want everything monitored. And at the end of the workshop, people were hugging. I'm not lying. Like people from all these walks of life. So it was like really positive. And people were just like, oh my gosh, this is what I think. Some people said, I think about this all day, every day. But to have these smart people who've been studying this problem without realizing it, ocean carbon biogeochemistry for, for their careers was so meaningful. So that's the last anecdote I want to share. But um, I think what we learned from this is there's a, an incredible amount of flexibility of what a working group does and is. You can have a working group that is meeting month after month to create a best practices document. And I think we've heard how that works. And that's a, a gorgeous deliverable that people will use for years to come. You can have a working group that is like figuring out what it is and what it can be. And like, we're trying this very experimental thing. And so I think the more universal advice is like to bring your creativity because this could be a, this could take a lot of different forms and we'll part of the this point of this working group is to be fully transparent in outcomes and so we'll try to really report back to the universe um of how this goes um what it's like to do this really really distributed um working group where where there's people folded into lots of stakeholders in a kind of core leadership group doing light agenda setting and archiving. If this creative approach is something that appeals to you, I also want to emphasize that OCB is one of the organizations that's going to give you that runway, um, where that may not necessarily be true for a lot of other proposal calls that you might submit to, mm -hmm. right? Like you're going to be locked into the proposal that you proposed. It probably has pretty well-defined objectives um, and outcomes and deliverables that you need to achieve. And I written a proposal before and know what a good proposal looks like, you know, and, you know, engaging in this kind of creative process almost creates a tension between mm -hmm. like what you expect to be the outcome of your work and like allowing yourself to be more flexible and creative <laughs> in this context. Um, so, you know, again, OCB is a resource that's going to let you explore that. Um, and I would say we're still sort of learning what that looks like. Um, and, and again, that's just a really great way to engage in career development as part of OCB. So um, submit your ideas. Uh, OCB wants to hear them, wants to give you um, the opportunity to explore those in its full facet of development, right? At the worst thing that they can do is give you really great feedback about how to make progress um, for the next time that you submit.
What a fantastic and uplifting note to let to to end this on. I I really feel strongly that there is incredibly important work to be done whether it's exploring these new dialogues, cross-sector dialogues, or developing a best practices guide, there's really important community building and dialogues to facilitate and work to do that that isn't a proposal. It's not, it's not going to get the accolades from a panel it's not going to be invested in any other way. OCP can facilitate those dialogues and 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 make those interactions achieve the outcome that they're looking to achieve. And and I really believe strongly that being adaptive and letting the community lead the way is how we get things done. I really do. And and we have. 16 years of success stories to, to prove it. Um, so I really, I want to thank everybody who was able to join us today. Um, I am so sorry we didn't get as many people subscribed as we thought we would, but I have a feeling everybody, as May said in the chat, will be watching it, you know, a week before the proposal deadline. Um, but I think this is such a valuable recording that we're going to just keep on the website um, as an as an enduring legacy and 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 resource for people who are thinking about proposing something. Um, if you're watching this recording and you're thinking about an idea, it is never too late to just call me up or shoot me an email and say, "Hey, can I talk this through with you?" Because I'm always happy to do that anytime. Um, uh, once again, as a reminder, there's an opportunity to submit your proposal two weeks before the drop dead deadline of October 27th. Um, there's an opportunity to submit your proposal on October 13th, Friday the 13th, what better day, um, to both, uh, to, to me and the project office and both me and, uh, and a subject matter expert from our scientific steering committee member, uh, our scientific steering committee will take a look at the proposal and give you some initial feedback before the final deadline. So feel free to use that opportunity. Um, Jessica, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, I don't think anybody said this and I'm kind of surprised by it. Uh, one of the things that helped me sort of understand that I wanted to submit an activity proposal and learn what successful ones look like was by serving on the SSC. It was like attending a review panel because I had reviewed a bunch of activity solicitations before. Um, so again, this is kind of a nice pathway of you know leadership and development that OCB provides for early career scientists. I was an early career SSC um, member. Uh, and so again, sort of getting to bridge that arc. And as I moved into my mid-career, leading an activity solicitation was is part of the story that I tell uh, about career development. So yay, OCB. Absolutely. Invisible and flag. Those of you who are out there, if you are ever offered the opportunity to sit on a panel with any of the agencies, do it. <laughs> it's been a very rewarding, it's a lot of work, but it's a very rewarding and valuable experience. Um, but I will conclude here. And once again, I want to thank all of the OCB scientists who joined us today and shared their wisdom and putting a proposal together and, and leading an activity. It was greatly appreciated. And I know a million, I can't wait to see how many views this one gets on YouTube because I think this is a, a really great resource to have out there. Thanks everybody.